So I would like to uh, wish everyone a good evening from uh, Denmark, which, where I am located now. Just uh, adjust a little so we can see Lumpu fully. And that's Lumpu for you. And look, this is a room dedicated to Lumpu. And the, the window, uh, the, um, the mirrors at the back, they have a little shape, which is similar to, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, amulet, an amulet, a Thai amulet, which, is, was, uh, which has been intentional to put some Thai elements into the interior design. And we can also see some other Thai elements right here, the little flowers uh, on the um, on the cover cover of the heater. It's, this room has been designed uh, by one of our um, experts in uh, in designing meditation room and ceremonial rooms uh, in our temple. Actually, the expert right now. And it's a very nice room, but it's not in use now. So uh, I have taken the liberty of using this room now for talk uh, to guide meditation and talk a little bit ab about uh, right view. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, right view with regard to uh, the, the meaning of right view and how it's um, kind of the opposite of, of a cynical cynical worldview or a cynicism and, uh, and how right view can help you in your daily life. And uh, maybe we can review some of that. I don't know if, if, if everyone was there last week or uh, two weeks ago. Um, maybe uh, Ashley, were you there two weeks ago? No? So we maybe can review a little, uh, maybe add in a few more new things because I did do think uh, Safi was there, uh, if I pronounce that correctly. And uh, Tony was there as well last uh, two weeks ago. So uh, maybe I'll just uh, put uh, re review some of the old stuff and uh, add in some new stuff for uh, today um, today's evening. Tomorrow, the uh, 10 young and old men <laughs> Will ordain uh, will be ordained as uh, Buddhist monks tomorrow. At um, uh, the ceremony will start at about nine o'clock, and uh, this is a very special moment for Europe. Each uh, each year, well, normally it's each year if there is no pandemic, and uh, this has been this is always a very special moment. I am happy to have been able to contribute to it and uh, to be able to do this uh, together. And uh, there have been many, uh, many people who have been working together to make this uh, ordination program possible for these 10 participants. And uh, it's often in, in our tradition, 10 applicants is a little small number, but actually if you compare to, for example, Christianity in Europe, it's very rare for 10 priests to, to be ordained at the same time, uh, maybe only three or four is more, much more common in Christianity. And so it's not really that bad of a number, but of course, this is really more of a novitiate uh, to, they are not really ordaining for life as Tony knows very well, because if, if that was the case, then Tony would still be ordained. He also joined the program uh, a few years back. So uh, this is a very nice program for people to have the opportunity to, to, to have a um, temporary ordination. There is a similar female program, a program for women in, um, in uh, Thailand, uh, but uh, there, is, there has been no uh, equivalent in Europe yet, uh, but we have to do that sometime because uh, I'm sure there will be many people interested to, to learn about uh, what it means to be ordained or what it means to lead a, a celibate life, even if it's only temporary. 
So this is uh, what uh, we are doing right now, and that's why maybe you can hear, hear a little bit, hear, hear hear a little bit of buzzing around here and a little bit of humming. And you want to hear it? I can open up the speakers a little bit. Uh, this is me opening up the speakers. Can you hear the humming and the buzzing around here of all the people working here? Yes? <laughs> well, I'm just going to close the speakers a little bit because otherwise it will be distracting during the meditation. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, nice and cozy and uh, to see all these people coming together to make this possible and also to have been able to see one, some of my uh, teachers as well, who I normally don't often have the chance to, to meet, uh, and now I do. And um, so this has been quite nice. And uh, let's, uh, I, I cannot join for long. Uh, next Monday, I will be already returning. And uh, I, I do not intend to, to talk this long normally for meditation, but people keep logging in. <laughs> so, so I just, uh, the introduction is a little long today, but that's not really my fault, is it? <laughs> anyway, um, the, the, uh, I will be going to Singapore on the 23rd, which will be shortly after my return to the Netherlands uh, this Monday. But uh, I will be continuing the next uh, broadcast uh, from uh, my, my, my broadcast in two weeks uh, from Singapore because they have a good Wi-Fi and uh, why not, you know? And um, they have a similar room like this, so maybe I can find it. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, um, my, uh, my yearly uh, moment of reflection and, and, and learning. Uh, normally, I go to Thailand, but in Thailand right now, the temple is still under strict COVID measures uh, because uh, our temple is such a large community. They are usually a little stricter than the rest of the country. So um, that's not a possibility yet or very difficult. So I'm just going to Singapore and see some of my teachers there. And uh, that will be for two weeks. So... Uh, I think that everyone has logged in by now. Um, so um, let's just start the meditation together. Just uh, working on the sound a little bit, maybe uh, just uh, making sure that you can hear me well. Okay. So please find your corner, find your place to sit comfortably. Always remember that the key to a good meditation posture is allowing your pelvis to be tilted forward a little, whether you are sitting on a chair or on a seat on the floor, because uh, that will make your back straight, your blood circulation will be undisturbed as well as your breathing. So you can even use a towel or something to hire your buttocks and make your tilt your pelvis a little bit if you're sitting on a chair. But uh, regardless, it's always the best to keep your back as straight as you can and to allow yourself to sit in a posture that is relaxed, but also alert. We don't have to sit straight like a puppet, but we should try to sit in a way that we feel alert. And then we breathe in deeply and we breathe out slowly. Yeah. 
And then we allow ourselves to fully relax. Always take good care of relaxing your eyes, the muscles in and around your eyelids. And if you relax them properly, relax them well, then you won't, you won't feel your eyes that much. They will be very soft. Maybe just raise your eyebrows for a moment and then relax. And we can also, if we like, imagine that we just had a shower and we feel completely relaxed. All our muscles and veins, all our pores are relaxed through and through, as though our entire body is suffused with relaxation and ease. And then we allow the relaxation to continue in our face, in our jaws, and we confirm that our neck and shoulders are relaxed, our arms all the way to our hands. And we confirm that our chest and abdomen are relaxed, as well as our back. And we confirm that our hips are relaxed, as well as our legs. We can gradually feel that relaxation is fully encompassing our entire body. And we can then leave and let our body be as it is. We don't have to concern ourselves with our body anymore. We just leave it as it is, as we are still in the present moment within our body, but we do not feel concerned with it. Thank 
Gradually, we are learning to allow things to be and to not get involved. We relax our thoughts about the past and the future. And we learn that we do not need to get involved anymore. All our thoughts of the past and the future, fears, frustrations and worries, we just let them float as they are. If we can't relax them, we just let them float. It's just a matter of letting it be. Letting it be the way it is. We can see the more we relax, the more we can see that we do not need to really put in any effort. All that effort that we put in to maintain all these thoughts and worries and concerns, we do not need to do so. We can just relax. We can just allow the luggage to just put it on, put it down put it down on the floor, just let it rest. Gradually, we are learning to simply relax our body and mind and to learn that we do not need to do anything at all. 
We learn to be satisfied with just whatever there is in our mind, whatever there is lingering in our mind. There may be some noise, there may be some litter, but we just allow it to be. Gradually, we learn that we do not need to seek or search for perfection. We allow the perfection to come to us by simply learning to do nothing. Normally, we always learn that he who seeks will find, he who searches will find. But in meditation, it's the opposite. We do not need to search for anything. We only just sit and be. Then we gradually feel we are reconnecting again with the center space. If we have already been meditating for quite a while, we will know where the center space is. At the core of our being, we know where it is. We will feel where our center is, the center of our body, the core of our being. We don't need the textbooks, the textbooks anymore. We simply just go to the place that we feel at ease and comfortable at the center of our body. With a very soft and gentle touch, very softly, very gently, almost subconsciously, we are reconfirming the existence of the center space within. And we gradually learn to become familiar with the center space. And if we'd like to use a mantra, we can do so. Listening to the sound resonating from within, as though there is a deeper you inside of you, as though there is a deeper us inside of us. Sama Arahang Sama Arahang Sama Arahang Sometimes it sounds like it's coming from very deep. It's not always very loud. It sounds from very deep, deep in our awareness. We're just listening to the mantra. Or if we are more of a visual person, we can allow the soft image of a sun or a moon to arise at our center space. And whatever shade of an image, whatever image or whatever memory arises at our center space, when we think of the sun, then that is okay. We just settle for whatever image arises. If it's just a yellow fade, 
or a wet shade. It's all good. And gradually it will crystallize, it will become more clear as we often reconfirm its position. We do not need to use any force at all. And we gradually unlearn the impulse to try to clear up the image by simply just settling for the image that appears, whether it's a shade or a very clear image or something in between. Images and sounds, they help us to stay at the center space, but we do not always need them. Let's just find what helps us. On a similar note, sometimes we feel that our center space is very large. Sometimes we feel it's very small. We will know what feels right for us. Step by step, bit by bit, we find our way. Step by step, bit by bit, we connect with our core. If we feel any tension at any point, we step back a little. We could say that we back off a little. But if at any point we feel we are distracted, we are recalibrating again to find what makes us we connect with the center space to allow the experience to be pleasant or to at least feel neutral and open. Gradually, we learn to find our way within. Step by step, bit by bit, little by little.
Gradually, we come to a point where we feel at ease at our center space, and we like to share it with the world. We allow the energy of the meditation to gradually, completely permeate our entire body, completely suffuse and cover our entire body and mind. And we smile to ourselves and we wish ourselves happiness. We wish ourselves freedom from suffering. We wish ourselves happiness and health. And with this kind attitude, with this kind attitude towards ourselves, we then expand this meditation as an energy to the entire world, as though it was a light or as though it was a little bubble expanding outwards and gradually becoming a big bubble and becoming part of the atmosphere around us. We then allow this energy of the meditation to expand to all the people around us, in the temple, at our home. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free from suffering. All the people at the temple, all the people at our home, all the people in 
our street, in our family, or our neighbors, close and far. May all be happy. May all be free from suffering. All the people in our neighborhood, all the people in our place where we live, and all the people in our area, in our county, district, province, all the people in our country, may all be happy, may all be free from suffering. May there be only happiness. May this energy of the meditation expand outward to all the people in our neighboring countries, to all the people in Europe. May all be happy. May all be free from suffering. May all the people in the world be happy, be free from suffering. May all the people in the world be living in peace. May there be no one who has hatred toward one another or hurt each other. May all be happy and healthy and find a way to happiness by their own strength. May all be happy and free. May the world be a better place and be at peace. We allow this energy to expand outward, to encompass all human beings, whatever nationality, religion, belief, or external appearance, and even animals, mammals, birds, and fish, may all be happy, may all be free from suffering, May all be happy in body and mind. Then we gradually come to the end of the meditation. We are still aware of our center space, which it which is at the core of this meditation energy. But we all become aware now of our senses. We can hear the sounds around us. We can feel the seat on which we're sitting and we can feel our body. And we remind ourselves that the center is always there for us and we can always go back to it. We can always learn in our daily lives to gradually let go, find inner pause and inner peace as a result. Then we gradually open our eyes at the end of this meditation. And I will finish with a short chant to mark the end. Sape puta palapata pate ganan palam. Aranta nanjate te narakang, Panta mi sapa so, Sapa putha nupa vena, Sapa tamma nupa vena, Sapa sankha nupa vena, Sata so di, Bhavandu te.
So this was the uh, meditation that we did together. And uh, it's been nice. And if you want to continue to meditate, you're welcome to do so. But I will continue our series talking about right view. A few years back, our deputy abbot in Thailand talked a lot about uh, right view. He very much emphasized uh, that this is at, at the heart of understanding the Buddhist teachings and how to apply it in our daily life. And as I mentioned, right here doesn't mean correct. Right here means on the path. As we may have heard, there is an eightfold path in Buddhism. And every one of those factors is called right. Right meaning leading to the aim of enlightenment. So right concentration is what we just did, meditating. But wrong concentration is, for example, when you focus on something that is not very uh, useful, uh, maybe not very wholesome. For example, wrong concentration is the concentration that somebody might have for when he's very angry and focusing only on one single person uh, in his thoughts. That is wrong concentration. So right is always about on the path of progress, on the path of spirituality. It's not just morally correct, but it's also useful, helping us, bringing us forward. And that's the meaning of right view. Just a moment, please. So as you can see here, this is uh, the uh, next, uh, this uh, part of the teaching. So last time we covered uh, some of the basics of our uh, right view. And we covered that there are three main negative emotions and unrealistic perceptions in, uh, in Buddhism. And you might call them the three true enemies of humankind. That is, if we try to improve our lives, we should always remember that improving your life should be about overcoming these. This is what we do in Buddhism. We train our mind, we train our character to be a better person. And uh, part of that very important part is that we grow out of these three. We gradually learn to be more content and happy with less and we don't need as much. And uh, we gradually learn to forgive more, be less hateful. And we gradually learn to see things more clearly, be less biased, and also to see ourselves more realistically with regard to other people around us. And that's how we gradually grow in Buddhism. That's the basic gist. So that's why Buddhist ethics is always about how we look at motivations. When we are motivated by greed, hatred, and delusions, we call this unwholesome or motivated in the wrong way. In an, and that will lead us to create actions that lead ourselves to suffering and lead others to suffering. When we are in a greedy mood, we want a lot, then we are going to hurt other people or we hurt ourselves by consuming in the wrong way or by wanting things that are not useful for us or wanting people. <laughs> so the other thing is there are also wholesome qualities that we can develop. And these are the opposites. Greed has as its opposite things like contentment, satisfaction, 
and also generosity and for example also being able to renounce things things that are not very important in our lives to renounce those hatred uh, as has as its opposites obviously love kindness but also tolerance and forgiveness delusion has as it as its opposite seeing things sharply wise and also understanding things and taking time to be mindful of things so when we talk about right view we have to understand that everything in buddhism is motivated by overcoming negative emotions and unrealistic perceptions sometimes right view has been compared with the dawning of a new day as i mentioned two weeks ago but there's some other metaphor as well that i haven't mentioned yet sometimes it's also compared with the seeds of good plants that have been sown so just like you have good plants and you sow them and you you put them in the in the ground then the ground the soil will improve because of those good seeds and in, in the end, the entire soil will improve, the entire land will improve because of those good plants. Because of uh, those good plants, the soil will grow and prosper. And because uh, of right view, therefore, our lives will be positive, but also realistically and improve in our words, our actions, our livelihood are the way we see things as well. So in every aspect of life, our views will somehow have an effect. If we are very, have a good outlook on life, which is realistic, responsible and optimist, but also, you know, looking at things completely, then we will find that we always find good reasons to do good and to start over if we have obstacles. But on the other, other side, if we are cynical, if we are looking at things with a bleak perspective, then we are going to struggle to do good. And we easily find that we settle back to our old habits. That is why right view is so important. Right view could be compared with what is known in psychology as moral reasoning, to be morally sensitive, the ability to see when there's an ethical dilemma or in, in, in normal words, when there's a difficult decision that you have to make, morally speaking, and you will be able to see how your actions affect others. Moral judgment, the ability when there is a difficult situation to really make a good decision and be committed to that moral motivation. And, and when that becomes a habit, it becomes moral character. To have a courageous persistence in spite of fatigue or temptations not to take the easy way. And that's really not that different from how we look at uh, right view in Buddhism. So you could say that uh, it's very much the same, in fact. So there's 10 examples that the Buddha mentions of right view, which are very fundamental. The four first ones are about leading your life in a happy way. The first view is that giving is important, that it's good to do it and that it helps our life. The second one is there is sacrifice, which means that it's good to help others. Uh, the word sacrifice is a bit confusing, but I'll explain later. There is offering means that it's good to honor people where honor is due. And there are fruits and result of good and bad actions means that there's such a thing as karma in our lives. Even though we can't always see it with our naked eyes, but those who meditate very well, they can see it with their mind. You may not be able to see it with the naked eyes, but you can see it with the naked mind, the mind that is very thoroughly trained. 
That's why the Buddha was able to see that there is such a thing as the law of karma, be, because he had well trained my well very well trained mind. But we do not have to take the words of the Buddha uh, uh, for for it. We can try to test and see whether this karma really exists by improving our lives. So let us just take a look at the first one. And uh, by the way, there are six others, but we'll get to that in a later stage. Let's start with the first four. In fact, today we will mostly talk about the first three. And these are, uh, they, they, they don't take too much time to talk about, but they are important. The fourth one is a little bit more difficult to explain and talk about. So we're gonna take some more time for that. Let's like look at the first three first. First one is the idea that giving really reaps fruits, that giving is a good thing to do, that giving makes the world go around. And that is useful to give, to share with others. And that giving will always help you. Even if giving sometimes seem to lead to other people to abuse or somehow uh, use that generosity in the wrong way, giving in itself is still very good. So for example, if we give to the poor and sometimes we are in doubt whether they will use it in the right way, we still have to come back to the belief that giving is a good thing. Why? Because giving will always ennoble the mind. And in fact, the Buddha said, this is the best way to look at giving. We do it to help others, sure, but also to ennoble the mind. Not to look for a good reputation, not to look for other people's praise, not always, not always being able to help others. That's an important part, but it's not always possible. But we give in order to ennoble the mind. That is what the Buddha said. So if we don't give and only accumulate things, we become stingy, compete with others, abuse each other, there will be never enough in the world, in the words of our deputy abbot. So giving is something that helps everyone. You need generosity in a household. If you live together and you only have your own little budget, uh, I have my budget, you have your budget, and we never share anything, <laughs> it's going to be difficult to, to start a family. <laughs> if you don't have any shared budget, don't have any shared uh, thing, then it's going to be very difficult. Uh, if you don't trust each other, then giving and trust is gonna come very hard. So giving is at the core of a good family life, but it seems also important in business. If you can't allow sometimes to sit, if you can't just sit at the same table with your competitors and look at how can we look at what are the shared benefits, what shared agreements can we do? What can we do to improve things, you know? That is also very important. It's not only about competition. It's not only about that. And if we only look at competition, eventually the people who are going to suffer most are the ones that are poor and have less chances than the rest. Now we have to look at giving. There is a famous teaching of the Buddha in which he gives several examples of giving and in which he talks about how giving, uh, there's actually uh, a, cere a ceremony which leads to this teaching. Uh, there's several uh, priests uh, that are the advisors of a king. And the king, he asks, what sacrifice should I do? How should I please the gods? How should I please the universe? And the, the priest, they say, you should kill this and this animal. You should sacrifice this and this goat, sacrifice this and this a cow and sheep and as they still do in Nepal these days. So sacrifice and sacrifice and, and, and so on. And the Buddha says that that's not useful in any way. It doesn't help. It's just something that people continue to say and say 
is not helping. But the best sacrifice is to lead a good and moral life. But if you want to give something, bring all the rich and wealthy people together and give to those who are poor. It seems to be a modern idea, but it's already there in the Buddhist text. Therefore, our abbot uh, always says that apart from giving to Buddhism, which is a good thing, we should also give to the poor. It's both important. So sacrifice is about seeing that is useful to help others uh, that are not always the same as we do. And if we don't help others, sometimes it's gonna come back to us. It's like in some countries, there are some problems with minority groups, you know, in the past, it used to be mostly the gypsies uh, and, and sometimes the Jews. And now there are other minority groups. And if we don't help each other, then eventually it's going to bite. It's going to come back to us. We do have to take care of each other. That's the idea of uh, um, uh, sacrifice really exists and is important. So sacrifice here comes from the original meaning. The term the Buddha used was sacrifice of gold, sacrifice of sheep and all that. And then he gave it a new meaning. Moral sacrifice means giving whatever we can spare to others who are in need. So this in, 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 the, in the present day and age, it could mean uh, giving to a good cause. Could also mean giving to religion, but it could also mean giving to that beggar who lives down on the street, but maybe sometimes giving bread is better than giving money. But then uh, there are many ways we can give, and that's important. Giving, therefore, is at the foundation of lo a lot of good things. The Buddha, whenever he taught, he didn't start with his teaching about karma. He didn't start with his teaching about merit. He didn't start his teaching about heaven, hell, or whatever people would like to know about. He didn't start his teaching with there is no self. He started his teaching with giving. Even those who were ready to become fully enlightened, he started with his, his teaching with giving. This is known as the Anu Pupi Katha. It's the step, um, the gradual teaching that the Buddha always gave. It's always started with giving. He hadn't even talked about karma yet just starting with giving how important it is in our lives, in our world, in the family life, in the work life, in our spiritual life. And when we give, we give up. When we give, we give something up that we own and therefore our hands become open. That is the idea. And then there is the next one, which is, um, sacrifice, right? As I already mentioned, sacrifice similar to giving, but we help the people who are in need, the help the people who are different than us sometimes. There is offering. Offering means that we think it's a good thing to honor people. These days, we tend to divide the world in political parties and political groups. And some groups, they think we should help the poor and other groups think we should not help the poor. And some groups, uh, they, they uh, adhere a lot of importance to uh, authority and other groups don't think authority is important. But actually, all good things are important. Generosity to the poor is important. And it used to be, a a very hallmark of conservatism to give to the poor. I don't know when that changed. <laughs> These days, people, when they think of conservatism, they think of not giving to the poor, which is quite the opposite. Anyway, to honor people and to allow people to grow, to be a leader, that is also very important. Of course, we also have to look at who is a good leader and who is not. It's so important that we have heroes. This is, a, this is a television program that was held about 10 years ago in the Netherlands. 
and they they try to find good heroes in the world or in the Netherlands with people who are uh, like uh, uh, had done a lot of good things. Uh, this this was uh, this idea was uh, uh, w this television program went on for a while, and the idea was that it's good to have heroes sometimes. It's good to have heroes to find inspiration, but not everyone agreed. Some people thought this and this person is a hero, is a good person. Other people didn't. That's 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 that we can talk more about that later uh, because we need to critically look at who can be a hero and who not. But it's important to have them. It's important to believe that some people are worthy of honor and credit. These days, we usually say uh, credit where credit is due, or honor where honor is due is used a little less, but it's the same thing. Uh, it's the same thing. Giving credit where credit is due is allowing people to be a hero, allowing people to lead, allowing people to, to come up, but sometimes people are jealous. Sometimes people are, have resentment. They don't like other people to, to be good. They don't like other people to lead. Uh, in the Netherlands, this is not uncommon. <laughs> there is an expression in the Netherlands that if you, if you raise your head too much, then maybe the next farmer will cut your head off. <laughs> It's an old expression coming from the time when people worked on the land. And sometimes when people raise their head at the wrong time, it would be cut off by the next farmer. There's a similar expression in Japan, which says that the, the knot or the, what is it? The, the, uh, the screw that stands out is, will be hit on or something like that. So, in many, some countries, sometimes people don't like it when people are different. Yeah. And sometimes people struggle with leaders. Yeah. Sometimes uh, people have problems with politicians or leaders. And sometimes we don't like it when somebody takes initiative and goodness. Some person comes to us and says, there's a good cause that I would like everyone to donate for. And you don't like it. You don't like it when somebody is good. You're looking for faults. You want, you want them to think they're hypocrites. <laughs> but if we always think like that, then how can we find encouragement to do good? There must be some good people. If we think back to our lives when we were still young, we have grown a lot. Isn't it possible that some people have grown a bit faster than us? Isn't it possible that some people can somehow be somebody who we can learn from. You know, this is the idea. And sometimes uh, it's, it's a struggle, you know, not only for lay people, also for monks. Sometimes we, we find fault with each other too much. But the more we practice to see good and to honor and give credit where credit is due, then the more we find encouragement and we want to grow in the example of the people who we honor. If we never honor anyone, then sometimes, uh, in the words of the Buddha, those who do not honor, they always will feel, be, feel a little miserable because you don't have anyone in your mind. But it's also like this. Everyone cares for goodness. Everyone cares for good qualities. But if you have somebody right in your front of your face, right in front of you, who does a very good job at embodying these qualities, then you want to be like them. And that's why it's, it's always very nice. Even like for me now, I have the chance to meet a couple of monks that I don't usually meet that often. So when I have the chance and look at these people and, and, and learn from them, then I can grow. But if I, if I never have that chance or never take that chance, then sometimes, you know, we might think uh, wisdom is a good quality, but we never have seen anyone who's wise, you know. Uh, so if we take the opportunity to learn, then we can notice, oh, we still have a lot to learn and we can grow. That's why uh, the Buddha said that the third 
right view uh, that helps us forward. Uh, that is like the sun uh, uh, at, at uh, dawn or is like uh, the plant that creates good soil is uh, giving credit where credit is due uh, and how that helps in our daily life. So there are many ways in, 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 in Asian culture in which honor is expressed, but it doesn't really matter at this point. I mean, it, that, those, that's a thing about ceremonies. We can express it in different ways. In the West, we have different ways of expressing respect. And in Asia, we have different ways of expressing respect. But at, at this point, that's not really the point. The point is, it's all good to express respect and to, to give credit where credit is due. And those are three things that I would like to talk about today. Do you have any question about this? Do you want to uh, ask anything or would you like to comment about this? This will be a good time for that. <laughs> well, I hope I, uh, it has been useful to some extent and uh, we can uh, review some of this. Can you, anyone want to say something? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's been nice. It's uh, the humming and the buzzing is growing a little more silent here. People are gradually starting to prepare themselves to go to sleep. And uh, so I guess we are gradually coming uh, to the point uh, where we are going to prepare ourselves for the ordination ceremony tomorrow. So if you want to see it, you can watch uh, uh, on the, um, well, I don't really know how you can watch it, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> But I'm sure there is uh, there are many pictures and videos going around on the social media of Damakaya Europe. On your local, the social media of your local center. So if you want to see it, you can watch it. Uh, there will be chances to do so. So I hope this has been uh, helpful for all of you. And uh, we can uh, meet each other again in the next time. And uh, we will have uh, another teacher next week. So I'll give the floor back to Nancy and Jitlada. Thank you, Zohalu Pisanda. It's a very helpful topic today. And I hope Pisanda enjoy to be a teaching monk there as well. And I hope everyone enjoy our Dhamma talk today. If anyone would like to pay respect to our teaching monk, please bow three times. Bow, bow, bow. May you all find happiness and health, wisdom and inner wealth in your life. May all your good wishes be fulfilled and may you find the inner peace of the Dhammakaya for a long time. Satu. Satu, Tokhanu Kisander. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Jimmy, Catherine, Ashley. <laughs> oh, you come, you come with your friends. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Natalie. Hi, <laughs> oh, lovely. Your friends. <laughs>